it's the place of first. It's actually the birthplace of the field of psycho-oncology or psychiatric oncology, the treatment of psychostimulants for fatigue in both cancer and AIDS patients, uh, studies of desire for haste and death, studies of inflammation and depression. Every time you develop an intervention and you don't have a good tool to use to measure what you want to measure, we're forced to create new tools. Even if happiness is beneficial for uh, the body, the grief is uh, what uh, develops the powers of the mind. Welcome to a new edition of uh, Beyond the Cancer Diagnosis interview series. Today, our guest is uh, Professor Braybart. Uh, hello, Professor. Nice to meet you, and thank you for accepting our invitation. Well, it's my pleasure, Adrian. It's yes. glad to speak to your audience who listens to Anko Daily. Thank you very much. Um, for the beginning, uh, also for our audience, uh, which cover the, the entire uh, world, uh, could you make a brief description of uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in terms of uh, history, uh, heritage and uh, perspective plans, briefly? Sure. Well, uh, as you mentioned, uh, my name is uh, William Breitbart. Um, I am a... Uh, I'm the chairman of the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. And I am the Jimmy C. Holland Chair in Psychiatric Oncology. I am trained both as, in internal medicine and psychiatry. And I went to do uh, a special uh, fellowship, a two-year fellowship, in uh, the subspecialty of uh, psychiatry called consultational liaison psychiatry or psycho or uh, psychosomatic medicine but at memorial sloan kettering the uh, fellowship was specifically in uh, psycho oncology uh, that was in 1984 through 1986. Um, in 1984, when i came to sloan kettering to do my training this was the 100th anniversary of Memorial Sloan Kettering. And so Memorial Sloan Kettering is now 140 years old. Mm -hmm. It was established 140 years ago as a small hospital in Manhattan called the New York, uh, the New York Cancer Hospital. And it evolved uh, uh, to the point where in 1964, it became Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center which was a corporation that involved two entities, Memorial Hospital and the Sloan Kettering Research Institute. And um, uh, we, are the, we are the first freestanding cancer center in, uh, in, the, in the world, I believe. And um, we have a very long history of making innovations in cancer uh, diagnosis and treatment um through innovations in uh, in surgery uh radiation therapy and uh, uh and uh, and chemotherapy uh including recent advances obviously in precision medicine gen genomics and precision medicine and immunotherapies etc um uh, uh, dr allison who uh, who won his nobel prize in immunotherapy uh, spent most of his career and did most of his research at Memorial Sloan Kettering before leaving uh, to uh, MD Anderson and uh, then eventually getting his Nobel Prize. So a lot of that Nobel Prize winning work. Uh, a lot of very famous uh, 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 people in the world of oncology, from Karnofsky to Blaylock, to famous surgeons. To, it's, 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 a place, it's a place of firsts. Uh, and um, when it comes to the field of psycho-oncology, it's the place of first. It's actually the birthplace of the field of psycho-oncology or psychiatric oncology, or as some people call it, psychosocial oncology, to acknowledge the fact that it is a multidisciplinary field that involves not only psychiatrists, but psychologists and, um, and nurses and uh, social workers, etc. 
the uh, the field of psychooncology was started at Memorial Sloan Kettering because in 1977, uh, the chairman of the Department of Neurology at Memorial Sloan Kettering, a rather famous neurooncologist named Jerome Posner, who uh, many of your listeners might know is is probably most well known for describing all the various paraneoplastic syndromes that occur that affect the nervous system in patients with cancer. He's a master diagnostician as well. Um, he, uh, he decided that uh, we needed to have a psychiatric, psych, uh, a psychiatric service within uh, Sloan Kettering to deal with patients who were struggling with problems of anxiety, depression, delirium, coping, uh, throughout the course of cancer, uh, from diagnosis through to cancer treatment, through end of life care, through survivorship, etc. And so, in 1977, he started uh, two services. One was the psychiatry service. Uh, the other was the can- the first cancer pain service ever established in a cancer center. Uh, he recruited Dr. Jimmy Holland who was the wife of a psychiatrist in psychosomatic medicine, who actually was the wife of a rather famous uh, oncologist named James Holland, who edited the major textbook of oncology for many, many years. And he's one of the pioneers, along with uh, uh, Emil Farber and others, of combination chemotherapy. They were quite a powerful uh, duo, couple, as you can imagine. So she was recruited as the first chief of the psychiatry service. And Dr. Kathleen Foley was uh, recruited as the first chief of the pain service. Dr. Foley went on to create um, the world's premier cancer pain service and worked with uh, the Project on Death in America, the the Open Society Institute, uh, to develop... um, uh, pal- modern American palliative care, palliative and supportive care. And so that pain service got uh, transformed over the last 40 years since I've been at Memorial Sloan Kettering uh, from a pain service into uh, what we know now as modern day American uh, uh, palliative and supportive care. And as a fellow and a young, a young faculty member, I was the liaison to the pain service and the neuro-oncology unit. Uh, and was mentored by Dr. Holland when I joined the uh, fellowship in 1984. Dr. Holland uh, came with one other faculty member, Dr. Mary Jane Massey, and slowly they grew into about a half dozen psychiatrists. Uh, um, And then they added a few psychologists who were starting to do research on various aspects of uh, uh, cancer, uh, both in adults and and, and, uh, pediatrics, uh, oncology. In 1978, she established a fellowship, a clinical fellowship, which is the one that uh, I, I, uh, I entered, and we now uh, we now just graduated our 46th class of psychooncologists, psych- psychiatrists, and psychooncologists. We also, for the last 40 years, have had a, a postdoctoral research fellowship training program. Uh, research uh, training six postdoctoral uh, fellows, mainly PhDs, in uh, research aspects of uh, psychology. Um, and so, there have been a number of uh, uh, in, in uh, a number of developments. In uh, 1984, uh, Dr. Holland helped found the International Psychooncology Society, and I was lucky enough to become a member of the found, founding member of the board of directors. About two years later, we uh, we founded the American Psychosocial Oncology Society, uh, and um, and then in 1989 we put out the first textbook called the Handbook of Psychooncology, which is uh, different than this. Uh, slightly, it was a predecessor of the series of the textbook of psychooncology, which um, I had the privilege of being the senior editor of uh, the fourth edition in 2021 was produced during COVID, the height of COVID. <laughs> That's why I spent most of COVID. A hundred plus chapters really outlining the, the depth and breadth of our field. Uh, and so um, in 1996, uh, we became a department. 
uh, uh, an independent department. And that department had two services, a psychiatry service. I became the chief of the psychiatry service uh, and uh, a, a behavioral science service, which uh, Dr. Jamie Ostroff became the chief of. And uh, when I became chair in 2011, uh, we added a third service, uh, um, Cancer Disparities and Immigrant Health uh, Service, focusing on issues like uh, cancer disparities, access to health care, access to cancer care, access to clinical trials, financial insecurity, financial toxicity, food insecurity, cultural and linguistic adaptations of many of the interventions that we developed in um, in, uh, in our research uh, uh, in the department. We have about eight or nine research laboratories within the department. I headed up the uh, psychopharmacology and symptom control lab. We did a series of studies looking at uh, different treatments of delirium, uh, treatment of psychostimulants for fatigue in both cancer and AIDS patients, uh, studies of desire for haste and death, studies of inflammation and depression in pancreatic cancer patients, most recent studies that we've done. I also head up the psychotherapy lab in which we've developed a, a number of novel, unique psychotherapies targeted toward cancer patients. I think are probably our most uh, well-known uh, in, uh, intervention, psychotherapy intervention that uh, my colleagues and I developed uh, is meaning-centered psychotherapy, which originated it, for it. Another which, uh, question that I want to ask you to okay, which, tell us uh, about. Which, which, uh, which uh, started out with uh, focusing on advanced cancer patients, but uh, we have about six faculty within the psychotherapy lab, and they adapted meaning-centered psychotherapy for uh, cancer survivors, for bereavement, for cancer caregivers, for adolescents and young adults with cancer, for coping with cancer pain, and then uh, a number of linguistic and cultural adaptations for Chinese-speaking immigrants in New York and Mandarin-speaking immigrants and uh, Spanish-speaking immigrants in New York. And uh, I think, I think, I think it's, the adaptations are endless. And then there were other trials uh, of, that, of, of ACT, uh, acceptance commitments of therapy, uh, um, um, uh, CBT, uh, other kinds of psychotherapies that were specifically adapted for uh, interpersonal therapy, adapted for cancer populations. We also have a uh, communication skills research training laboratory. We have a neurocognitive laboratory that looks at the cognitive effects of cancer and cancer treatment and interventions for that, often involving exercise or neurostimulation. We have a geriatric oncology uh, a psych a therapy lab, which develops interventions for older cancer patients, psychotherapy interventions for older cancer patients, and also screening tools to, to, to diagnose. Every time you develop an intervention and you don't have a good tool to use to measure what you want to measure, we're forced to create new tools. So we, we've, we've developed a number of, uh, over the years, I developed a new me um, measure of delirium, the memorial delirium assessment scale, a new measure of hopelessness, a uh, measure of desire for haste and death called the SAD. But We've had to develop you all that measure. With the patient and after you uh, yes, well, came with well, the results. Yes, all, all um, most of the research is done by psychiatrists, psychologists who uh, who do quite a bit of clinical work as well. Um, and so the the clinical work informs the interventions that are necessary. We also have a decision-making and biogenomics laboratory, a cancer prevention control laboratory, which focuses on things like smoking cessation. Um, uh, uh, a lot of our uh, labs have taken interventions and uh, worked with industry to develop uh, digital apps, thera therapeutic apps. Uh, we have a pediatric psycho-oncology program. We have uh, neuropsychology, uh, neuro, uh, pediatric neuro, and adult neuropsychology program. Uh, so there are a number, of, and then we have an immigrant health cancer disparities research lab, which focuses. So there's a lot of research that goes on, and this research uh, uh, is uh, intended, obviously, to change uh, the practice of uh, psycho oncology to benefit uh, 
cancer patients in all stages of disease and, yeah. and disease prevention and survivorship. Yeah, uh, we are talking about psych oncology and um, we are talking about cancer being in a uh, patient being in the center of care of our whole attention. person, what we call whole person care. Whole person care. And until, uh, until there is a cure, we need to provide care. Yeah, yes. It's and the mo motto of our department. Yeah. Uh, according with uh, what you, you've mentioned and you've said, um, Scott Fisher uh, pointed very nice uh, when he wrote, show me a hero, and I wrote a tragedy. Uh, if we are talking about uh, cancer survivor, uh, what word would uh, we put uh, if we say, show me a hero and uh, show me a cancer survivor and I write, uh, what it will be the word to name? Well, uh, I think the most important thing to tell anybody with cancer, uh, particularly a cancer survivor, uh, uh, and this is something I think that uh, I have this as the uh, the quotation under my signature on my uh, email. I took I took it off because people thought it's it's a little pretentious. But I um, I said uh, courage. I'm sorry. Hope is the courage to create an uncertain future, and that is the nature of survivorship, and that is the nature of living with cancer, and that is the nature of the struggle of to maintain hope and to live uh, a human life with meaning uh, throughout any stage of life, throughout any stage of illness. Um, life is a struggle, and the struggle is to maintain our authentic selves, a life uh, with uh, meaning. And uh, there are many external events that buffer our lives, like war in, in, in Europe or in the Middle East and many internal dangers, illnesses, cancers, tumors, things like that. And the struggle is to maintain the essence, of, to retain who we are as individuals. So now we'll go in, uh, let's say, on the European uh, part of uh, writers that, uh, uh, for example, Marcel Proust said that uh, even if happiness is beneficial for uh, the body, the grief is uh, what uh, develops the powers of the mind. After decades of experience, what do you think about this argument? And uh, about, you mentioned about hope and uh, everything. Yes. Well, I think that uh, it's important to know that, uh, that uh, we live lives that are full of joys and suffering. And uh, there is meaning in both joys, uh, tr uh, triumphs, and tragedies. And that, um, to quote Viktor Frankl, uh, um, uh, even, even when we're facing suffering, we have the choice to choose how our attitude towards suffering and to find meaning even in suffering. And so uh, the realization that we have the choice uh, in creating uh, our lives in the face of suffering. Carl Jasper has defined suffering as any encounter with limitations. Um, and uh, I, I would say that uh, death might be the ultimate limitation, but going through cancer illness, even survivorship, uh, there are, we're encountering lots of limitations, causing lots of suffering. We can choose our attitudes towards the suffering. We can make choices towards that will allow us to regain and and to uh, to regain the essence of who we are. So the choices that we make are um, are driven by the attitude that we have towards suffering. And if the attitude we have towards suffering is that we are going to make every effort to preserve uh, the sense of who we are. And to and to preserve the sense of having of 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 who we are, uh, having a meaning, uh, then um, you can even drive meaning out of a suffering experience. I will uh, ask you a last question. Okay. Because um, 
everyone uh, more more let's say uh, actual today everyone is talking about uh, e-health digi-health uh, artificial intelligence uh, briefly what is your opinion uh, on the artificial in, uh, intelligence impact on psychological care it is or uh, yes well uh, so I, I think uh, your question uh, included both uh, sort of digital therapeutics uh, as well as artificial intelligence. And I see them as being obviously very linked. Um, uh, I mentioned to you that uh, before the interview started that um, in developing meaning-centered psychotherapy, we had a psychotherapy, uh, a structured, brief, seven-session psychotherapy that we showed in four randomized controlled trials could um, uh, in, enhance quality of life, uh, per, uh, reduce depression, reduce anxiety, reduce symptom burden, distress, increase hope, decrease desire for haste and death, uh, decrease physical symptom burden, distress, and it was all mediated through uh, uh, enhancement of meaning. And we've undertaken for the last 20 years trying to train as many clinicians as possible uh, in meeting center psychotherapy through conferences at meetings. But in the last 10 years, we've been funded by our National Cancer Institute in the United States to do what's called a R25 training grant. So for the last nine years, we're going into our 10th year starting this fall. We've trained about 700, uh, close to 800 uh, clinicians from around the country, including some international uh, people. Uh, the two-day workshop using actors as as as, uh, as patients. We've met. We've actually have treatment manuals, obviously, for all the various forms of meaning-centered psychotherapy uh, uh, that uh, that have been developed. So there are treatment manuals that are available for people to, to for therapists to buy. But you can also we we've, we've also been actively training people and trying to provide a cadre of providers for this kind of therapy. That's just one specific kind of therapy. Uh, if you take a place like Sloan Kettering, Memorial Sloan Kettering, we, I don't know, we see uh, 900,000 people a, a year, a million people a year. You take all of the cancer patients in every other cancer hospital. If I, uh, at, at Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, we have um, about uh 20, 21 psychiatrists and about 14 psychologists who do clinical work. And then uh, 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 another 10 or 12 folks who do primarily research and a small amount of clinical work. Uh, MD Anderson basically has six psychiatrists and uh, psychologists, and they are, um, uh, they, and they treat more patients than us. So it's vitally important that we find a way for patients to have access to our therapies uh, when they can't get it face-to-face uh, -face or even through telepsych from a trained individual. So moving to a dig digital therapeutic platform for the delivery of all sorts of interventions is critically important. And artificial intelligence is one of the most helpful ways in which to transform a structured manual like our uh, a therapy, like, uh, like meaning center psychotherapy into a digitally delivered psychotherapy because of the, you know, a, a patient says something to a therapist, there are a thousand answers. Yeah. Uh, actually in meaning center psychotherapy, there are only about 10 different answers, but uh, artificial intelligence help, will help us develop digital therapeutics of, of all sorts of types of interventions and artificial intelligence will play a great role in that. In research, it will be uh, an enormous boom in order to be able to take large data sets of patients and look at outcomes, uh, uh, disparities in outcomes, um, uh, looking at issues like inflammation and depression and, uh, and, sure. and all sorts of uh, research questions that artificial intelligence will help us with. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Thank you, Adrian. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to Onka Daily on YouTube. Hit the bell icon to stay updated.